and actually for the first time ever, I started to feel inside frightened, properly frightened. It's the first time I was I was conscious of the fact that actually if I didn't get this right, then there might be not a positive outcome to this particular trip. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Rob Forsyth joined the Royal Navy in 1961, and by March 1962, as a young officer, he joined HMS Auriga, a 1945 vintage diesel submarine. Within seven months, the 22-year-old was loading live torpedoes and preparing for a war mission aboard Auriga during the tense days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Rob tells of many fascinating incidents in his career, including under-ice operations and an incident where his submarine commander made an error which almost resulted in the total loss of the submarine and crew. He also details what it was like to take the Submarine Commanding Officers Qualifying Course, also known as the Perisher. This six-month course is a prerequisite for command of a submarine. Failure means your submarine career perishes. Now, I could really use your support to help me continue to produce these podcasts. A monthly donation of $4, three pounds or three euros via Patreon would really help. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from Tim Slansky, one of our supporters. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. If you're interested in supporting us financially, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. I'm delighted to welcome Rob Forsyth to our Cold War conversation. I wasn't a volunteer. Uh, I decided to join the Navy because my father was in the Navy during the war, and I remember him coming home when I was five and uh, admiring his uniform and said, I'll join the Navy. But, of course, in those days, if you expressed an interest, that was it. You did what your parents wanted, and I joined the Navy. So I went to Dartmouth, but I found it a bit of a disappointment because I joined shortly after it had been almost a public school so many of the staff were still tutors who had taught teenagers. And I was 18. I could drink, like girls, and was fairly sort of full of life. And suddenly I found I was only allowed out in the evening till 6 o'clock once a week and 10 o'clock on Saturdays. So I found that quite restricting. I think it's fair to say I, I started to get a slightly dim view of the Navy. But when I qualified up to two years at Dartmouth. I went to see a minesweeper, which was great fun. It's sort of a small wooden uh, boat, really, with a small crew, very informal. It was great fun, and I liked that. But I was then sent to a frigate, which was bigger and much more formal, and it seemed to spend all of its time either painting itself or holding entertainments, cocktail parties. And it was significant to the, the biggest part of the workup we did at Weymouth finished up having to host a VIP visit and a cocktail party, which sort of seemed to me the wrong uh, sort of perspective on life. The priorities were wrong. And after about a year or 18 months at sea on the frigate, when the first attendant I had failed to see eye to eye on quite a few occasions, I was called into the captain's cabin one day and he said, uh, Forsyth, I, I think we've got to do something about you. He was offering me a gin and tonic at the time, which was encouraging, but he didn't often get called into the captain as a sub-lieutenant. And he said, I think your original and informal approach to naval discipline is probably going to get you into trouble. But I know where you'll be very well suited. 
so I'm sending you off to submarines. Ah, I said, I'm not sure of it. And he said, no, no, don't argue, my boy. You join the Navy, you take the Queen Shilling, you are going to become a submariner. Off you go, and you land next week in, uh, I think, we were off East Africa, and you go to Nairobi, fly home at the start of the course in six weeks' time. And that's what I did. And actually, for me, it was like a duck to water. It suited me fine. The informal atmosphere of submarines, the camaraderie, the binding together based on understanding of how responsible everybody had to be and how you only kept the water out of the submarine in a state of float if you all knew your job and trusted each other, created a quite different atmosphere. So while I was called Sir, uh, I was called Sir slightly so to Voce until I proved myself, passed my training course, and demonstrated that I was now a competent submariner, same as the chef or the captain, really. So that's how I joined. And actually, a lot of people were not press, were press men, not volunteers. Well, how long was the training, the, the training you had to do before you were qualified as a, as a serving officer? Well, you did, you did about uh, I think it was three months training at uh, HMS Dolphin in, the, in, uh, in uh, what were then wooden huts with uh, coke-burning stoves. We're not too long after the Second World War. Um, then you go off to sea and you have about another three months of sea training which finishes up being tested by the first attempt of the boat. And the test really consists of uh, sitting in the wardroom answering questions and then a walk through the submarine, either with all the lights out or more normally blindfolded, and being invited to place your hands on all the valves and pipes that are essential to keep the boat floating. So the did a crisis you would know in the dark and under pressure exactly where to go and what to do to keep water out. And everybody did that, as I said, from the cook to the captain on the first joining. And then you, then you, then you were qualified uh, and called a submariner. So, so what was your first operational posting? Well, that was quite exciting. My first boat was called uh, HMS Ariga which I joined in Devonport where it was refitting, and then we took it up to Scotland. I was the junior, what was called the fifth hand, uh, lowest of the low officer-wise, and my job was to go after torpedoes. And we did our work up for Fazlane for two or three months, and I met a girl I decided I was going to marry, which I later became engaged to. Uh, and uh, while we were engaged, uh, you may remember a thing called the Cuba Missile Crisis. Well, that happened soon after we got engaged, and uh, I found myself standing on the casing of a Riga, storing for war to go on patrol as part of the uh, reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis, not sure when we were sailing if we'd come back, heading for what was believed to be uh, a nuclear world war, possibly. So that was quite sobering for a young 22, 23-year-old. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so were you told that this was a a war mission, or or what? What was your 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 briefing before you set sail? Well, we knew the we knew about the Cuba crisis. We were in harbour as the uh, the crisis developed, and as the uh, naval blockade was placed around Cuba, and we knew it was about it was happening. And as it was about to happen, the captain just got a signal: store for war. That's all it says. Uh, so we did. So you fill the submarine with all possible provisions. Um, we had a false deck all the way through. An A-boat had a gangway which ran from forward to aft and torpedo room right the way through the submarine back to the after torpedo room. And that gangway was lined with stores. <clears throat> so we were walking on uh, tin milk. I don't think we took any beer on that particular trip. Tin food, uh, bully beef. Uh, we had bread hanging from the deck head, so we just stuffed it full. And the torpedo room was full of warhead torpedoes, uh, which uh, I was had to supervise loading uh, for a full war outfit. And how, how did you feel about that, that, you know, almost your your first posting was... Great. We just thought it was so exciting. <laughs> 
I tell you, 22, 23, actually, you don't have any of the caution, risk assessment, uh, hesitation that you have when you're older, which is why I guess if you look at uh, most conflicts, the people who perform get younger and younger in wartime because you don't think about things and it's a big adventure. Yes, you get frightened, but but actually you have a sense of uh, survivability or, you know, it won't happen to you, it'll happen to somebody else. Of course, if you're all in the submarine, it's going to happen to all of you at the same time. But that doesn't really cross your mind that much. You're nervous in a sort of a way, but then this is what you join the Navy for, this is what you train for, and actually your whole focus now is doing your job as well as you possibly can with this little bit of excitement running through it that actually it's going to be different. Were you able to tell your fiance where you were going? No. I think she guessed that <laughs> the, the radio was full of Cuba, but I wasn't specifically able to, mainly because we didn't know where we were going. And in fact, we, we were sent off into the Atlantic, we, we found out later, uh, as a part of a barrier to detect Soviet submarines heading south through the Iceland, Faroes and Faroe Shetland gaps to detect them and report in case uh, the Russians were reinforcing more submarines into Cuba. But in fact, the whole thing resolved quite quickly when, I suppose, when Khrushchev realised that if he wasn't careful, there was going to be a nuclear war because he was losing control of his own forces and the Cubans in particular. And of course, we've only found out recently, just diverting slightly, how close we did really come to nuclear war. We think it was the standoff uh, between the US and, uh, and Russia, and there might have been a missile exchange. But the biggest danger was the fact that four Foxtrot class submarines were in the naval blockade area and they had nuclear torpedoes on board. And they had been given permission to fire them if they were attacked, subject to approval by the captain and one other person on board. Well, the American Navy, to encourage these foxtrots to surface and take themselves out of action, dropped explosive charges, not depth charges, reduced charges, which is an international signal to surface. But it could be interpreted as a hostile action, which one submarine did. And the captain was all for firing his nuclear-tipped torpedoes. And he got agreement from the other political commissar on board. But there was a third person on board called Captain Vasily Arkhipov, and he had authority as well, and his approval was needed because he was the sort of commander of the flotilla. And he said, no, no, I don't wish to cause World War Three. We will not fire surface. And they did. But if it hadn't been for Arkhipov, a nuclear-tipped torpedo might well have set off a nuclear war. Later in life, he got a peace award from America and died of old age and a happy man. And I think we all should be happy too. But that, that was the real danger, not that Khrushchev would order a firing or that uh, the USA would fire. I don't think either of them ever intended to fire. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's a really interesting story. One, one I've heard before, but I think he's relatively unknown um, amongst many people. I will make sure there's a link to the show notes for this episode uh, mm. to that so that so that people can investigate that that story further. Were you given orders that you could open fire or, or what were your orders should you find a Soviet submarine? Was it just to track it and follow it? Our first instruction was to track it and follow it and report it. Uh, not so easy in the old days in a boat because we only had HF radio, so if we detected one, we'd have to come to periscope depth, raise a radio mast and transmit, which, of course, would immediately reveal our position. But we almost certainly had... Uh, I mean, I didn't see the patrol orders myself. I was a pretty junior chap and spent most of my time in the torpedo room. But I'm pretty certain the patrol orders would have permitted us to defend ourselves if attacked. Well, they would have done. How long were you on Ariga for? Not just that mission, but you continued to serve on uh, Ariga. Yes, yes. I went out 
to Canada. Um, she was quite an exciting boat to be on. <laughs> uh, on prior to Cuba, a uh, workup, we actually coming out of Londonderry, which if one comes out of Londonderry for exercise, is you always come out slightly hungover because of the hospitality of the Northern Irish and the RAF at uh, Seagull was uh, notorious. Having fought it way down the river, fallen out to the sea, we sort of died one morning in complete silence, feeling slightly quiet. But at 110 feet, there was the most enormous bang, and the submarine went over 30 or 40 degrees sideways, and we were told to service an emergency, which we did. I had the job of going to the bridge where I was for about the next four or five hours while things were assessed. It was pouring with rain, I remember, and freezing cold. And we had to go back to harbour where we docked and found we'd ripped something like 10 feet off our bilge keel uh, in an area which we shouldn't have hit anything. In later days, when they did echo sounding to clear the channel for SSBNs, and instead of using vertical echo sounders, which just look up and down, they used side scan echo sounders, which look at the horizontal picture, they found out there was a whole cluster of pinnacles where we died, where many submarines had died for many, many years, and it was only chance that a, another submarine hadn't hit them. So that was that was quite exciting. It was sort of an indicator to come. And we then went off to Canada, which didn't have any submarines, so the British lent them one or two eight boats to act as training uh, submarines for their service navy. Um, took my wife, and we had 18 months, very happy time, working out in Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia, which in winter is very cold, wet, and miserable. And the Canadian Navy didn't like that. They used to decamp down to Bermuda, where they had a base on George's Island in the old naval dockyard, uh, in order to get more operating time, they said, because the weather was better. So we spent large amounts of time in Bermuda sipping gin and tonics when not at sea and uh, generally enjoying ourselves, phoning home to wives who were digging themselves in the snow out of their apartment in Halifax. Slightly strained conversation sometimes. <laughs> I think you, you mentioned in your notes that you had a, a bottoming out incident in Ariga as well. We were on an exercise north of Nova Scotia and south of uh, Newfoundland, that area there. And our captain, who I can say was probably not the wisest of captains, decided he would evade by bottoming. Now, before you bottom, it's normal practice to have a good look at the chart and check that it's firm and not too deep. Well, I don't. Th he did check the depth, which was something like, 300 feet, which is pretty deep for an A-boat in those days. Uh, we had a diving depth, I think, of 500 maximum, 350 preferred. And it didn't check what the bottom was. And we went and sat on the bottom while the Canadian frigates hunted for us for hours. And slowly with the battery drained and the oxygen got used up and the air became foul and you couldn't light a cigarette and the lights went yellow and we couldn't even run a cinema projector to watch a film. And then finally, the Canadian frigate stopped looking for us, and the captain said, right, I think it's time to get off. But we couldn't. We, uh, we, we couldn't, the propellers wouldn't turn properly. Uh, we couldn't get any movement on. We were stuck. So in the end... And you have to understand that in a submarine, you carry all the air you need for servicing in bottles inside the submarine. You know, once you've used all that air, it's gone. He said, uh, surface, full main blow, and blew all the bottles. And we turned the propellers, one ahead, one astern at the same time. Mm. And we just sat there and sat there. And then very, very slowly after quite a long time, the depth gauge started to shallow. And then we just went up like a cork out of a bottle at high speed. In fact, we went so fast, the submarine was sort of leaning over slightly as the conning tower fin was forming a sort of sail as we went up. 
and we surfaced in what must have been very spectacular form, but it was dark, and at night, fortunately, there was nothing above us. And I once again, junior officer, was told to go to the bridge, which I did. The smell was horrendous. It just was dead, decaying matter. And when I put my hand on the top of the fin, which is sort of 25 feet from the waterline, I put my hand on mud. We had been buried in silt, probably washed out of the St. Lawrence River and, I don't know, millions of years of erosion, and we were as near as, damn it, never going to get off. So that that's the closest I got to probably actually uh, not making it. Fortunately, at the time, being young and inexperienced, I didn't know to be frightened. I only became frightened afterwards when the older, wiser engineer officer in the third hand told me how close we'd been. So when when you were down there, you always thought that you were going to get off and, and, and surface? I presume we would, but the others, the ship's company, the wiser one, the ship's company, thought that we might not. Wow. So sometimes it's good to be young and innocent. Yeah, that's got to be a submariner's worst nightmare, that sort of scenario. Yes. So, so you know, poor judgment by the captain has it in the whole submarine. It was a message I carried in my head always, of course, and later in life when I became teacher, it was one of the stories I told, of course. But going back to the boat, why we, one of the things we did while we were there, of course, is we were not too far in winter from the ice line. So the A-boats were early uh, proponents of under-ice operations. We, we would uh, head for the ice edge, dive and go under the ice and practice working with uh, ASW aircraft, the uh, the Canadian Air Force, and uh, practicing looking for submarines under the ice, which is quite a co- complex and uh, skilled task to do, working out how you look after a submarine in an ice environment, the lessons of which are still being learned today, like uh, never leave your main vent shut all the time because they'll freeze shut and then you might not be able to open them, when, uh, you know, all sorts of things you keeping things moving and cycling and how you cope with frozen things. Uh, But in a diesel boat, of course, we needed air to charge the battery. So it was constantly on the lookout for if we had a fire or a flood or ran out of battery and we needed to charge the battery or come to the surface, we had to find thin ice, thin patches of the ice which were, we called Polinias because that's what the Russians called them. And a Polinia was either a patch of water or thin ice that was thin enough to break through. So we had an echo sound uh, which we ran upward looking to chart the thickness of the ice. And one of the main things we focused on was to plot all these thin patches so we knew where to run to if we needed to. Um, and it also, it was it was a bit like being in a pantomime when they do the underwater scene at a pantomime, and everything is sort of hanging down, and there's all sorts of you know a whole feeling of being underwater on the stage. Well, looking through a periscope was not dissimilar because of the optical aspect of the top periscope being slanted. A lot of stuff above you looked as if it was in front of you, so you sort of felt you're weaving through a fairyland because. You could see quite a long way underwater if it was still, which it generally was. You could certainly see the bows of the submarine, which is most unusual. Normally underwater, you can't see anything. Right. Is that that's because that the water in those climbs is just normally quite clear? Clear, clear, and clean. Now, I'd, I also understand you you were doing trials with floppy magnets, which I know has created um, quite a conversation on Twitter, courtesy of Eric Moreno, who uh, managed to buy one and uh, had had shown some photos. Can you tell me what a floppy magnet does? <laughs> yes, that one of our concerns was uh, in the early days the Soviet submarines were fairly noisy, but if they found out why they were noisy because they didn't have noise reduction techniques like we did, then they become harder to find. 
And so um, it was quite a clever idea. The idea was if you can't if you can't hear them properly, but you know where they are once, if you could drop a magnet or two on them with a little clapper attached, it would attach itself to the outside of the hull and make a noise, and then you could just track the noise. Because, of course, they couldn't rem- remove it while dive. They'd have to surface to remove it. So we did some trials uh, where... In our case, it was tracker aircraft, but they also did them from uh, other ways of dropping them from ships and things. But Canadian tracker aircraft, which came off their aircraft carriers, would fly low over us, detect us with their magnetic anomaly detection equipment. And having located us, they would then drop a dozen or so magnets or more, some of which stuck to the hull successfully. But inside the boat, which is like living inside a drum, an acoustic drum, the bloody magnets made a hell of a noise. I mean, they were about, uh, I suppose, about seven or eight inches long, big, strong magnets, and then just a hinge flapper. And the trial was entirely successful. We thought we'd go nutty. When it finished, we surfaced and thought, well, we'll now pluck them off and get rid of them to go home but they'd all penetrated under the casing into inaccessible places. And we travelled back to Halifax, which took two or three days, with this dreadful din inside it. So I've never forgotten the clapper trials until uh, a week or two ago when I think Ian Ballantyne, who I think you've spoken to, who wrote up some of our stories in Hunter Killers, one of the stories he put in had been about the clapper. And this chap, Eric Moreno, tweeted, I bought a clapper. And there was a photograph of one. And he followed it up later with a video he got, heaven knows where he found it, which had been put out by the USN on the trials. It didn't have us in it, unfortunately. But uh, it's caused a lot of interest. I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it, not a Twitter storm, but definitely a mini storm caused a lot of interest. Yeah. Yeah, it. I mean, from what you're saying, it's almost a psychological warfare weapon as well. If you can't get rid of the thing and it's banging away, yeah. I mean, uh, they they decided not to proceed with it, but actually, if I was a Soviet submarine who just emerged from the Iceland and Faroes Gap to go on patrol for six, eight weeks off the east coast of America with three of these stuck on the hull, what would you do? Would you stay on patrol? Would you go home or go mad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so when when you finished on on a Riga, you're a sea lion at, at, at Faz Lane, and you're you're working on uh, the propagation of sound in in water. Can you tell me about that? Yes, I I got really interested in underwater sound while on Auriga because we had to cope with some quite difficult water conditions. You have the Gulf Stream going north and the Labrador Current coming south. Um, Bermuda appears out of the ocean like a volcano uh, and has all sorts of strange water conditions around it. Um, and uh, water conditions in the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle were always interesting. Um, and and, and I, I was aware of the fact that we actually didn't know much about how it was, there were some rough rules. If there was a, a, a thermocline of water where the temperature varied, then you could have conditions where you could be at periscope depth and the ship could pass a mile away and you couldn't hear it, which seems strange. But sound doesn't travel in horizontal lines. It varies depending on the depth, temperature, salinity, and all sorts of things, and can bounce along the bottom. It can get trapped in ducts underneath the water so that if you're off the English Channel, you can hear ships coming out of New York Harbour. You can hear whales sometimes from hundreds of miles away. Yet on other days, you can pass by a ship and you just can't hear a thing. Well, when we went to sea, the next boat I went to was called Sea Lion. And we did quite a lot of Atlantic work as targets and uh, trials and uh, all sorts of things. And in that time, 
I became increasingly interested. The science was becoming to emerge and we were getting tools to calculate how sound traveled in water, to draw diagrams, calculate the distances they could go. And I, I became quite fired up by it. I, I got really interested. And in fact, at one stage, I said, I'd quite like to go off and do a degree um, in oceanography. So, uh, but the days of doing degrees as seamen officers hadn't yet arrived. And I was told if I did a degree, it, that was my career finished. So I didn't. But what they did do was to send me to uh, HMS Vernon, the surface ship anti-submarine school in Portsmouth, to do an anti-submarine course because the surface ships were taking the whole business of propagation of sound much more seriously. And they were the only course that was teaching the theory of sound. So I spent 12 months learning how to be an anti-submariner as the first submariner to be on a course like that. So I'm actually qualified to be an anti-submariner and a submariner, which causes a bit of split in personality from time to time. <laughs> and I, I think when you were with Sea Line, you were also involved with um, INS Dakar, which was the old HMS Totem. Well, yeah, that followed on because uh, ha- having expressed all this interest and done this course, what they then did with me was after Sea Line and doing the Sonar course, made me put me on the workup staff in Faz Lane to be the sort of officer in charge of training in the use of sonar. So I would go to sea regularly uh, with workup submarines, passing on all the knowledge I'd now got. Now, while I was there, INS Dakar, which uh, had been uh, sold to uh, the Israeli Navy, um, came up for workup. Uh, it was the former HMS Totem uh, T-boat. And I was told to go to sea on her for a week or two to uh, check her out for safety and to teach her how to use her sonar. Uh, the first really interesting thing, and, and I should say at this point, that when she finished and went home, she disappeared in the Mediterranean, lost, and nobody knows quite why or where, but she never made it back to Israel. And I think I probably know the reason, because I went off to board her on a small boat, you know, one of our uh, uh, boats that run out of of Faz Lane to take me down the Clyde. And when I approached the submarine, she appeared to be what I would call uh, half, she was half submerged. The water level was lapping over the top of her ballast tanks, what I would call trimmed down which is a condition you sometimes do if you want to dive quickly. So instead of having to clamber up over a ballast tank and climb up on the casing, I could step from the boat almost straight onto the casing. When I went on board and met the captain, I said to him, "Uh, why are you trimmed down so far into the Clyde? We're not yet in diving area. He said, I'm not trimmed down. I'm in full buoyancy. And I thought, gosh, that's that." She, she must have what's called a very small metacentric height. Uh, a submarine's a bit like a toy. If you roll it over, you know those round children's toys? You push them over sideways and they always roll upright? Yeah. That's because they've got a writing moment and it's called a metacentric height, a technical term. And if the metacentric height becomes zero, there's nothing to bring you upright, you just roll over. Well, the metacentric height of Dakar must have been negligible. Anyway, off we went to sea and dived, and it was quite an interesting trip, because after a while I said to the captain also, why don't you look through the periscope? There's fishing boats and things around. He said, in the Israeli Navy, we don't look through the periscope unless we absolutely have to. If you put a periscope up, somebody might drop a bomb on it. He was in war mode. I was in peace mode. So I said, for my sake of mind, put the periscope up and check that fishing boat over there. It's not going to run us down. But it was yeah. an interesting shift of thought. Anyway, just to finish the story, I think what had happened, that Dakar had stored in the conning tower in a chamber put in there for swimmers to use to swim out from the submarine, a special chamber. They had filled it with come-in-handy stores when they were in the dockyard. 
And so she was top heavy and heavy. So if in fact she ever got a, 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 a big wave on the beam when she was on the surface or when she was diving particularly or surfacing when you're most vulnerable, when your buoyancy is poor, or if she had hit something which had pushed her over more than 20 or 30 degrees, I think she would have turned turtle. Though I think she, she just sank because she turned over. Uh, and that potentially could have happened to you while you were on board doing the workup trial. Something I was very conscious of, and I was quite pleased that actually all our workup was conducted in what's called the inner areas in the Clyde. We never went out beyond the island. We were always uh, north of Ailsa Craig alongside uh, Aaron. Um, you're then posted to uh, Singapore. <laughs> yes, yeah. S- Singapore was, uh, I would say, it was lotus-eating land. Yeah, we hadn't yet withdrawn from Singapore, but we were going to not too long afterwards. So we still had a Far East fleet, and life continued, really had resumed after the Second World War into a very happy routine, tropical routine, start work as early as 8 o'clock in the morning, sometimes a bit earlier, finish at 1 o'clock latest and the rest of the day off. So everybody in a harbour would repair to their various clubs or wherever they lived, and we all had a swimming pool, uh, the officer's club had a swimming pool, and we would meet our families there and lay the, the day away in the afternoon. So we worked early and played early. Um, the Indonesian confrontation had finished uh, a year or so beforehand, so there was no active threats in the area. We spent quite a lot of time doing goodwill visits. In fact, we had two big trips, one to Sydney, Australia, which was amazing. We were on an exercise where we steered almost due south to Australia, never saw a ship, never saw an aircraft. And my track ch- our track chart that we submitted for the wash-up uh, had just a single white line running down the middle of it, which we had decorated either side with doodles and comments and poems and anything to fill in the time because it was quite boring. And we won the prize for the best decorated chart of the exercise. Uh, so that was sort of indicative. It wasn't, wasn't too serious at the time. We had another visit where we went up to Yokosuka, Japan, to meet uh, the U.S. Navy submarines there. Uh, the most notable thing, if this sounds slightly lighthearted, it was. It, it didn't strike us as being too serious at all. We were, we were enjoying ourselves. We were definitely submarining and practicing our art, but there was no threat, so there was nothing sort of serious behind it. Uh, but while we were in Yokosuka, we were berthed alongside two or three American submarines, and our electrical officer at the time uh, wore a monocle. And in immaculate whites, shorts, white shirt, socks, cap, would go up in the evening to do evening colours on the casing when the ensigns hauled down. And as the uh, trot sentry quartermaster sounded the still, he would open his left eye and the monocle would fall into the top pocket of his white shirt. This received enormous cheers from the American submarines that berthed nearby, who were slightly less formal, were crowded up to see what the Limeys were doing. And by invitation, he conducted, I think, evenings, evening colours every day thereafter, including the monocle, to rounds of applause. <laughs> it, was, it was an in, in, interesting life, these little things sort of, you know, Made living in living in the submarine was fairly horrendous. So you know you needed some uh, light-hearted things to uh, pass the day. I can imagine that absolutely. You were involved in some SBS training. Yeah, that was more serious. Paddy Ashdown, MP, had been out in uh, Singapore with the Royal Marines uh, before us, and he had done a lot of SBS work and pioneered ways for. Special Boat Service, Royal Marine Commandos and people like that, for those who don't know what SBS is, to exit submarines. And you could either swim out with a breathing apparatus through a torpedo tube, which was quite interesting. You would, instead of a torpedo, you put a swimmer in the tube, flub up the tube, open the bow cap, 
tap three times on the back door of the torpedo tube and he would eat himself out and swim away. The other way of doing it was for him to exit through uh, an airlock, water lock in the gun tower, uh, go up to the top of the conning tower, uh, hold on to the periscope while you took him close in shore, raise and lower the periscope a couple of times as a signal and then he'd swim off in shore. And the other way of doing it was to have canoes. Um, and a fairly classic manoeuvre was to have two canoes and four SBS uh, soldiers. And you would surface in the dark about five miles offshore, open the torpedo loading hatch, shuffle the two canoes out as fast as possible because you're in danger while the hatch is open if you had to die for any reason. They would sit in their canoes on the casing, holding each other's paddles across their the top of the canoes, shut the hatch, everybody down inside, two canoes sitting in their canoes on the casing, and then the submarine would dive vertically and gently underneath the canoes, which would float off, separate, and have a rope between the two canoes. The submarine would move forward with its periscope raised, snag the rope, and tow the canoe, stream behind the periscope by the rope, as close inshore as they could get to their destination. And when they got there, we'd flash a red torch up the periscope, which they could see coming out of the top of the periscope. Then we'd pull the periscope down, and off they'd go, off on their trip and whatever uh, operation they were to carry out. And the reverse would happen to recover them. Uh, They would paddle out in their canoes uh, out to the rendezvous point, um, and they had a thing called a trongle and a bongle, which were a bit like football rattles, which you could turn a handle and make a noise underwater, each one slightly different. We'd stick the periscope up, steer between the bongle and the trongle, and when we caught the rope and they'd swung in behind the periscope, they would flash a torch at us and we knew we'd got them, tow them out to the sea, surface, and bring them back on board. That, that was the practice. Now, can I tell a little story here? Yeah, we love a little story. (laughs) Keep going, Rob. Okay. (laughs) Well, they wanted to make a training film of this, but you can't really film in the dark. So we were really unlucky. We were sent to the island of Pulo Tioman, which is where they filmed the South Pacific, to film it by day. I think the island is now uh, a holiday paradise with a big hotel. But when we were there, it was just as the same as when they filmed South Pacific, the enormous great beach. And the Marines set up camp on the beach. Uh, we anchored about a mile off. They had, uh, they had supplies brought in by helicopter and a dinghy. And every day, they and a crew of BBC cameramen, I think there were three or four of them, would go out to the submarine and we do the whole thing in full daylight uh, filming. And then, of course, with lenses, they'd make it look dark for the actual training and film. And we had to go through all the operations, which included at one stage the cameraman saying, do you mind not diving properly? We'd just like you to stop halfway down. <laughs> I was first lieutenant. And I looked at the captain and he said, Number one, you do the trim, not me. I haven't got a clue. You do it. (laughs) So I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll do it if you go and sit on the bridge and tell us if we got too deep. So the captain went up onto the bridge. I think a couple of sailors volunteered to go with him because theoretically they wouldn't get their feet wet. And we shut the hatch and uh, I trimmed the submarine and gently took it down the sort of 10, 15 feet. And from the bridge, the captain down the boys' pipe was shouting, that's enough, that's enough, I think we're deep enough, stop. <laughs> so that was quite amusing. Anyway, come the end of it, the uh, Royal Marines were to be flown off in a helicopter. And they c- came off and the helicopter arrived, took away the dinghy and all their tents and all the rest of the rubbish. Um, flew flew that to the mainland and said they'd be back for the men shortly because, of course, they could only carry so much. But this helicopter had flown in the beer every day for five days to keep the Marines' uh, thirst quenched, and I think the water must have dripped on the carburetor because the helicopter went down. 
Well, we were anchored a mile and a half, a good mile and a half off offshore, couldn't get in any closer, and the Marines were on the beach, and we were talking to them by radio, and I said, uh, I'm not sure what happens now. And they said, that's fine, we'll swim out. So we saw these little figures go into the water, and I think it was six Royal Marines, swam a mile and a half out, came out of the water like seals, absolutely stark naked with their berries on, saluted, <laughs> said, permission to come aboard, sir, removed their berries, took their wallet out and clambered down into the boat. <laughs> Great story. Great story. Was it around this time that you did Perisher? Yes. I, I thought I was out in Singapore for two years, and my wife and our two children, I we were out in Singapore for two years. Uh, but my captain recommended me early for Perisher, so we flew home after only a year, sadly. I hadn't seen that much of Singapore. I spent most of my time in Australia or Japan or Hong Kong, but my wife loved it, as did the kids. So we flew home for Berisha, yeah, um, in the summer. Yeah, summer of 69, we came home. And and tell me your experience of, of Perisher as a student. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, you don't really know. If you had a good captain, and I did have a good captain, but not all captains were as generous, I had done a lot of practice command time. He was very free in delegating command to me um, as much as he possibly could, including an opportunity offered carrying out uh, visual attacks on passing ships and things to to sort of get the feeling for what I should be doing. Um, so I I I felt I felt moderately competent, but but until you do it, you've heard so many tough stories, uh, you don't really know. And actually, it was a sweaty experience. Uh, nothing really prepares you mentally for it because it's reality, and to suddenly realise you're actually in charge of. Uh, 270, 300 feet of submarine with 70, 80 people in who are totally dependent on your judgment, not just to carry out an attack effectively, which is the object, but also to keep the submarine safe. And to be honest, the first part of the perisher is more about assessing the safety capability of trainee captains. Can, can they do two things at the same time? Can they be aware of the submarine and it it must continue to be safe uh, uh, while carrying out an attack on a target in difficult circumstances, which will take you into danger. So you're going to hazard the boat, but can you do it safely? So uh, the reality is quite mind-bending. And uh, behind you is teacher who uh, is keeping a beady eye on you. And if he thinks you're not safe, he will go through what he calls the flood queue routine if you haven't. So basically, to take a submarine, those submarines deep in those days, it's changed today. Uh, the phrase was full ahead together, flood queue, uh, 110 feet, and off you went. And the queue tank was located right forward in the keel. So if you flooded it, it put weight forward very quickly to tilt you downwards as well as the hydroplanes. Um, and it would take you, you had to allow a minute to get below any passing ship. So you could never let a ship get closer than one minute at full speed from you. Uh, if you didn't get that right, this voice from behind you would shout out, full ahead together, flood queue, and your heart hit your boots because you knew you'd cocked it up, got it wrong, and uh, do that too many times, and... Uh, you wouldn't pass. Not only that, it would actually cost you a drink at the bar in the evening, if not two for teacher. And and it worked up in my day. It's changed today. Nuclear submarines are quite different ones, so I can't really talk about that. But in my day, and for quite a long time afterwards, till we phased out conventional submarines, week one would have one ship, week two, two ships, week three, three ships, week four, four. And if you were lucky and had a week five, in the days when we had the ships, no longer, you would have something like a fleet auxiliary with four 
escorts and uh, to weave your way through that lot and avoid the fishing boats in the Clyde, all of whom were very keen to get a net over your periscope in order to claim compensation. And they were particularly good at doing that. In fact, we suspected they had nets pre-ripped in order to claim anyway. <laughs> um, it was a slow build-up of tension until this final week. Uh, mm. And if you got through that and passed, uh, you were a very happy man. Did everybody pass on your course or were no, there some? No, no, I, there were two who didn't. Do you know what sort of failure rate there is on that or, or when you were doing it? During my time, for quite a long time, it was running at about 30%. Some of it which is quite high, um, but some of it was because captains were reluctant not to recommend people. They would perhaps duck the issue and say, I'm not prepared to stop his career and say he can't do perisher. You had to be recommended for perisher. So they might recommend people who they actually were dubious whether they'd passed but gave them the benefit of the doubt. Um, some Somewhere because you just can't tell. It, to, the ability you need is uh, is a strange one to be able to know what's going on around you while your whole head is entirely focused on what's in front of you and you need sort of 360-degree thinking and vision. Um, and uh, not everybody necessarily has that aptitude. We all have different aptitudes, but that's uh, sp spatial thinking and spatial vision. You need both and, uh, and courage and the ability to remain calm and probably in the end, the ability to conceal your feelings. When, when, when you think everything is going wrong and there's a problem, you don't really want your ship's company to be concerned. You want to be until you want them to be concerned. So you tend to have to develop quite a, not a blank face, but uh, to keep your feelings to yourself. And these are all quite complex skills to acquire. Um, not everybody has it. Sadly, it's called perisher. Uh, it would be better if they didn't qualify rather than failed um, because, it, of course, people went back to general service with a slight slur. But then to be a submariner, I would say, you had to rise above the herd. To get on to perisher, you had to get up again. So not to qualify for perisher didn't mean that you had failed at all. It just wasn't your thing. And you had qualities which could be used elsewhere. Some managed to achieve that and, and got, had very successful naval careers. Other people actually finished them and they left the Navy. Uh, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting insight into uh, perisher. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, the the first boat that you're commanding officer on is is Alliance, I believe. Yeah, now that dates me, doesn't it? I mean, uh, I, I give little talks uh, for charity on my days in the submarines occasionally. Um, when I say I joined submarines in 1961, my first command is the museum at uh, Gosport. Uh, people look at me and you see them thinking, oh, and he's still alive, he's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I took command of her um, when she came out of refit for her final operational time. Her last refit finished in 1970 um, and uh, worked her up and was her captain for two years and uh, very fond of her and, of course, now very attached to her now that she is the museum uh, in Gosport. In fact, I've been a trustee of the museum for quite a few years till I uh, retired. Yeah, it must be really strange seeing it, you know, after spending a lot of time on it, seeing it as a museum ship. Well, the strangest thing is uh, in refit, uh, you have to choose the covers for the wardroom settees and bunks and so on. And so I asked my wife if she would like to do it. So she did. And they're still on there. <laughs> So whenever we go down, as you said, it's a bit like going home, really. Oh, dear. That's that's great. Now, I understand you, you uh, have a bit of a story about crossing the bay. I'm presuming Bay of Biscay. Yes, yes. 
We uh, we spent a lot of time, mainly our time was mainly spent in the Mediterranean. Um, in the days when we had a Western fleet, uh, we were the, quite often allocated to the Western fleet of their submarine and tagged along behind while the carrier <coughs> carried out flying operations. Then every now and then we're told to dive to fill in time to the next carrier ops for some frigates to do some ASW work. That was one thing we did. We did do some uh, looking for Russian submarines, and uh, we uh, also did quite a lot of acoustic trials, which I enjoyed uh, with the Italian Navy and uh, some scientists. But so we were coming and going, I only said that because we were coming and going across the Bay of Biscay quite a lot, and the Bay of Biscay can be calm and it can be a nightmare because it's a great big bowl. And when when you get a full weather front coming from America, building up big seas from the west, it can be a very unhappy place to be on the surface. Well, one, I think it was in autumn time, we had an exercise with some uh, Nimrod aircraft down the channel in worsening weather conditions. And as we turned left to... Uh, head out of the channel, down across the bay, uh, it was Storm Force 10 worsening, and the uh, the Nimrods flew home and said, have a nice trip. They would be home in about 45 minutes in the bar in an hour. We had quite a rough crossing ahead of us, so I decided we would do a dive. It's quicker on the surface, <clears throat> but the weather looked so bad, I thought perhaps we should dive and wait for the forecast for it to moderate. So we dived, went deep for the night, uh, ran down the battery a bit, uh, and uh, came back up. But the forecast was wrong. Instead of abating, when we came back to periscope depth, it was about force 12 at least. Visibility at periscope depth was nothing. You couldn't see anything. The boat was rolling so badly because we were steering south and the seas were coming from the right, from our beam, from America. So we were rolling 30 or 40 degrees left to right. People were being sick all over the place. But we couldn't stay deep because we just hadn't got a big enough battery to cross the bay on the battery. So we were going to have to run the diesel engines, snort, to charge the battery. So we started the diesel engine to snort, which means you have a mast sticking above the water with a big ball bearing in it, which shut when water comes over it. But of course, water was washing over so fast that it was shutting all the time. So the engines have to stop when when there's no air, and then you have to restart them. And to restart them, you have to use high pressure air. As I said earlier about the bottoming exercise, you carry all your air in bottles inside the submarine. So we were slowly getting through high-pressure air, restarting the engines. People were being sick as dogs. We couldn't see. And the battery was going down because we weren't getting any charge into the battery. I thought there is only so much time we can carry on doing this. Um, And uh, it just got worse. And actually, for the first time ever, I started to feel inside frightened. Properly frightened. It's the first time I was I was conscious of the fact that actually, if I didn't get this right, then there might be not a positive outcome to this particular trip. I was going to have to make some big decisions. I couldn't go deep. I could barely stay at periscope depth, and perhaps I was going to have to surface. But we were in a sh- shipping lanes, uh, big ships appearing uh, with uh, no warning at all. And so long as we were pointing at them, we had a chance not to uh, be run down. But if I was to surface, I'd have to turn head to sea, which would be at right angles to the shipping lane, and then I would be much more vulnerable. And I'd only have one chance. If I surfaced and used the air and we didn't get up properly, we got washed over because you go through a moment on surfacing when you have no writing moment, then we would be in danger. Uh, but at that point, the captain's face has to be quite calm while inside, actually, I was, I have to admit it, frightened. So I thought about it carefully, discussed it with the first lieutenant, briefed the ship's company, 
uh, move some of the buckets of sick out of the control room, which we kept tripping over. It was, we were in a terrible state, really, morale-wise, explained to everybody what we were going to do and said that this surface was a critical one. It could be carried out safely, but nothing should go wrong. So we went to action stations, the highest state of alert, and when ready, turn to starboard, head to sea, and uh, surfaced with all the air we had, which flattened the air in the bottle. So we had no more air, but we were on the surface. We could run a, an air pump to top up the tanks, and we could turn back, head to the shipping lane. Uh, but then, of course, started to roll 50, 60 degrees, even worse than we had at Periscope Down. Uh, so we were on the surface, shut down, hadn't opened up the hatch because the waves were so big, 30, 40 feet, that they would have washed straight over the conning tower and come down the conning tower and flooded the submarine. So we remain in a dive condition, but on the surface, taking five to ten minutes each on the periscope because we couldn't cope any longer because you just were so sick with everything swirling in front of you. Really worried that we would we see a ship in time to avoid it, um, and on we went. And then about twelve hours later, when the ship's company, to be honest, were we were all pretty tired, but uh, the weather we'd heard was going to moderate, and it slowly, slowly, slowly moderated, and it dropped about force nine, I think. And I said to the first then, I, I said, number one, I think we should open the hatch and get a bigger charge on because the battery still isn't properly charged. We're, you know, we're, we're pushing things. I think I want to get more air into the submarine than we can get from the stalk mast. So we're going to open the hatch and try with the hatch open. So you then rig a thing called an elephant's trunk, which is a canvas tube around the bottom of the conning tower hatch, and rig underneath that a big canvas bath called a bird bath to catch the water and put a pump with a hose in it to pump out any water that gets into it. First attempt and two lookouts put on the safety harness with clips. And when I thought that there was a bigger gap than usual in the ways, I said to the first turn, open up. And he opened the hatch and they went up to the conning tower, hooking themselves onto every rung on the ladder as they went so they wouldn't get washed off because within minutes a great big swell came through and filled the conning tower with water, came down the hatch, filled the bird bath, started the pump to pump it out. And the uh, first tenant sent the lookout down to shut the hatch and he said it's not safe to have the hatch open so you're just going to get full of water. This was down the voice part. He said, oh, we'll stay up here and we'll let you know when we can open the hatch. Well, he was up there for hours and then he said he was getting cold, which I understood. Then he said, the weather I think is better. I think you should come up and take a look sir, and see if we can open the hatch. So I went up with a safety harness, arrived on the bridge looking out to the west saw the biggest wave I've ever seen in my life and said, shit. <laughs> and he said, it's moderated quite a lot, sir. You should have come in up here two or three hours ago. <laughs> wow. Anyway, we opened the hatch and uh, on we went. And that's the closest I've ever got to one decision wrong being uh, not having a positive outcome. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Frederick Esposito, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. 
goodbye.